continue what I preached last week. I'm going to kind of review just a little bit of it and then continue with that same thought. I believe, is it the first one, Luke? So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Luke. And uh, we're going to get there in just a second. But I want to just review a couple of things. We have several guests in the house. Thanks for coming to Cross Life Church and just uh, being a part of our worship service today. I want to tell you this, okay? I want to tell you this. There are tons of great churches in El Dorado. That was lame, Cross Life. Okay? There are tons of great churches in El Dorado. Okay? All right? If the Holy Spirit wants you to go to this one, that's fantastic. We love you, but I'm not going to get up here and try to give you a good sales picture why you need to go to our church because it's the best one in town. Because frankly, because frankly, his church is fantastic no matter which church you go to. So if you happen to be here and you're looking at where to go to church, if the Holy Spirit says come to church here, then obey him. If he doesn't, I want you to know that I bless you, and I just pray that the power of God and his prosperity will be on your life no matter what you do and where you decide to go to church. Amen? All right. I'm tired of playing the game. Anybody with me? Okay, good. There, in 2 Samuel, there was a promise given to David. David's name means beloved. He is the beloved what his name means? It's David and Dawa. His name means beloved, and at the same time, it means sick. Now, I don't understand why his name means sick, other than his son Solomon twice mentions this uh, this issue, describing the beloved in Song of Solomon. He says, "I am love sick." Literally, it's a parody of the name of his father, and so King David is promised an eternal kingdom from the time that he begins his reign. Jesus, or, uh, uh, Saul says, not Saul, Samuel says in uh, verse 16, your house and your kingdom will continue before all time and your throne will be secure forever. Everybody out there? And so here we have this promise that King David, who was chosen not because how handsome he was and how, and how fantastic he was and how much of a skilled warrior he was, he was chosen because of one reason, that his heart was after God. And so the one who had a heart for and to love God, was, who was called beloved, was, was told that he would have a kingdom that would be established forever. And on his throne, David's throne, there would be someone who would rule for all eternity. Amen? And so that was the promise. We talked about how in, uh, in, in eschatology, which means end time events, that the son of David, okay, that the son of David is the one that we are longing for his return. We are longing for his coming. We, we understand that when in the New Testament they would cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. They were identifying Jesus as the, the, the messianic line that was coming. And they were uh, worshiping and identifying him correctly. He was more than a prophet, more than a teacher. More than a good, uh, a miracle worker, he was the son of God, the son of David, the Messiah, where we, we've all been looking for. Amen. And so at the very end of the Bible, at the very end of the book of Revelation, there's this, there's this verse that says this. It says, Behold, I'm coming soon. And then the verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Amen. The spirit and the bride say come. That should be our position when it comes to end time uh, doctrine, eschatology. My position isn't what day, what's going to happen, when the rapture is going to happen, how it's going to happen. That, that, that's, that none of that's wrong. I, if you like that kind of stuff, then get after it, man. None of that's wrong. But my position is one of spirit, not one of natural. It's the spirit that says Come. It's the same heart that was on David, the beloved, that longed for his beloved. Song of Solomon, I believe it's 5.8, says this. There's this picture of this woman, and, and uh, she, is, she is the one who is the bride who's going to marry the beloved, and he comes to the door, and he sticks his hand through the door. I mean, remember this, right? Nobody remembers this. Anybody ever read a Bible before? Okay, great, great, great. You're good. We can start over and do something else, okay? But anyway, the, 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 the king 
He comes, the beloved comes through and sticks his hand through the door, and she, said, and she gets up and she makes herself ready. Those of you who understand end time events, listen to what I'm saying. He comes to the door. He sticks his hand through the door. She gets up and makes herself ready. And when she goes to the door, he is missing again. And then she goes searching for him. While she's on the street searching for her beloved, are y'all with me? The world sees her and persecutes her. Are y'all okay? Y'all, 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 y'all tracking with me? And, and when they persecute her, her one response is, Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, tell me, have you seen him? I am love sick for my beloved. And so if you take all that and lay it against end time events, that there is this church, this bride who has been persecuted by the world and who is searching for the beloved and they are wrapped up in love sickness. They're not, they're not responding to the persecution. They're still holding fast to the love sickness. Because they are a people who are of the kingdom of the beloved. Oh, this is good stuff. And so last week was good because it was just was. And uh, so if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it. Okay? This week is a continuation of that. The birth of beloved's throne. Luke 1. The angel said to her, everybody, this is not Christmas, but how many of y'all would appreciate some Christmas weather right now? 110, not cool, y'all. So the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Yeshua. You shall name him Jesus, okay? He will be great. Great are you, Lord. See, you're no different than that angel who was announcing his greatness on the day that he was. It's like what we do. It's our our position in creation to call forth his greatness. He will be great. He will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne. A throne that I just read to you all the way back in 2 Samuel was promised forever. Every time I say forever, I want to be very much forever. I mean, anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of y'all don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, then watch a YouTube video, okay? Sandlot. Anyway, but it's this forever throne. Forever throne. You're going to have a boy... You're going to call him Jesus, and the the Lord will give him the throne of his father beloved, his father David. So when Jesus shows up on earth, it is the announcement not only of his coming, but the rest of eternity. He's coming as the son of man, the son of God, the son of David. Three references of sonship he's called in the Word. In the New Testament, three references of sonship. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He is the Son of David. And he sits on an eternal throne that is forever. Somebody say amen. Okay? And so, verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. When Jesus showed up in the flesh Through the birth of Mary, his kingdom wasn't just for 33 and a half years. His kingdom was forever. And I'm telling you right now, he's still 100% man, he's still 100% God, and he's still 100% king who sits on an eternal throne, the throne of David, and of that throne there will be no end. Come on. Are you with me? Mark 11 Speaking of the kingdom of that throne, Mark 11, 9 says this. Those who went before him and those who followed him were shouting. This is toward the end of his earthly life. This is days before his death. He gets on a small little coat, a foal, and he is riding into Jerusalem, and they are laying palm branches at his, at, in front of him, and they're taking off their coats, and they're laying them down, and he is riding in, and everybody's cheering and shouting and celebrating, and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom 
of our father, beloved David. Hosanna in the highest. They recognized that he was Messiah, and not only was the Messiah coming, listen, but the Messiah and his kingdom was coming. Are y'all with me? So there is the establishment of Christ on, uh, in Messiah. And you have to understand that as they're sitting here watching this, and they're sitting here, and I believe that they are genuine, and I believe that they are emphatically saying, Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming, the kingdom of our father David is coming, and they expect Jesus to walk up into Jerusalem, bust some heads, set his throne on, in Jerusalem, and begin to rule and reign from that position. Y'all with me? That's what they've been taught their entire life to believe. Except when they see their Messiah being crucified, it throws them for a loop. Because they have no sense of the eternal kingdom. Are y'all with me? The, The kingdom that has no end. The kingdom that goes on forever. And so the fulfillment of Jesus being A, the one who sits on the throne and one who is the the king of the kingdom that is eternal is not just for your life today. It wasn't just for for their life in Jerusalem. It's not just what you need next week uh, in your finances. I'm telling you, it is a perpetual, never-ending kingdom that when you're 487 billion years old and you've been worshiping around the throne for 150 years just as a little break, You took five minutes off and you went back to the throne. And I'm telling you, you'll be doing that for all creation, all eternity, because that is the eternal kingdom that is coming. It's a kingdom of beloved. Are y'all following me? It's a kingdom of beloved. I just want to stop here and say, if you step back and look at the vastness of, 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 of our finite minds trying to imagine what eternity looks like and the eternal kingdom that was established by God through the prophet Samuel into David, that eternity would happen from your line. Are you with me? And all of it started in a young boy who made a choice to love God with all his heart. The power, look at me now all across this room, the power of your devotion to Christ, the power of your love to God has eternal ramifications. I'm not talking about just you going to heaven or you going to hell. Is that one young boy who was in love with God made a decision to follow him with his whole heart and based upon that decision he was chosen as king and based upon that his kingdom shall have no end. How much credit do we give the enemy and his strength to knock us out of our spirit, mind, of our heart and our love and affection. And one week, man, we are going after God with everything that's inside of us. And next week something happens and it's just everything we can do to crack open a Bible, to pray a prayer, to sing a song. But I'm telling you, as powerful as hell is, the Word says that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, that there is a superimposing grace, that your decision to go after God, your decision to love God is eternally powerful. But see, hell's decision to fight you has a time limit. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. I'm telling you right now, your decision to love God is eternally powerful, and hell's decision to fight your life has a time limit. Because he is eternally going to be a defeated foe who will be locked up forever. Amen. And while we're celebrating and worshiping on a new heaven and a new earth with the eternal throne of David, he was no more. Somebody say amen. And so his fighting your life has a time limit. But your devotion to him is eternal. Somebody say amen. I ain't even got to my sermon yet. Hope you packed a lunch. So we have the throne of David. We have the kingdom of David. We have the tabernacle of David. And this right here is is a lot of teaching stuff, but, man, it is powerful. So, again, I say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. 
Acts 15 brings us to this point where the Jerusalem council and the church is meeting together and they have this problem that they don't know how to deal with. Gentiles are being saved. You, people like you who are not Jewish are being saved and they don't know what to do. Do we make them observe the, the law? Do we make them do this and this and this and this? And they're arguing amongst themselves and Peter is arguing and James is, is, is standing up at the end of hearing all these things and this is what he begins to say. James the leader of Jerusalem church, the apostle says, Peter, Simon, has related how God has concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. How many of y'all have the name of Jesus on you? And he begins to prophesy through the prophet, quoting the book of Amos, and this is what he said. With his words of the prophet, with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written, after these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, I will restore it, and I'm doing that so that. This is the cause and effect. There is a tabernacle of David. Now hang on just one second before you go any farther. If David... If David's line is eternal, if his throne is eternal, if the son of David is eternal, if the kingdom of David has no end, are y'all alive out there? The tabernacle of David isn't a momentary happenstance in the timeline of history. It is also an eternal tabernacle. And here we go. I'm going to restore this tabernacle, this skin tent, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. That's us. Somebody say amen. Says the Lord. Okay, what is the tabernacle of David? I'm going to teach you some things that maybe you know, maybe you don't know this morning. Uh, these things are fascinating, okay? David, in Samuel, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, if you haven't read 1 and 2 Samuel, read them, okay? They're phenomenal and to understand David. David is the king. There is the tabernacle of, everybody say Moses. The tabernacle of Moses is where they would come once a year and they would offer that sacrifice, right? And the priests would go into the holy, the high priest would go into the holy of holies, right? Y'all with me? There were animal sacrifices. So the tabernacle of Moses is set up. It is a tent. There is a very lengthy description of that tabernacle down to what the tassels need to look like, what the, what the tent's made out of, how long the poles are, and they use measurements like cubits and things. Okay? Very detailed. Tabernacle of Moses. The Philistines come along. They're the bad guys. They don't like what's happening. What do they do? They attack. They take from the tabernacle the ark. They take that ark back to the Philistine land. And because they've taken the glory of God from Israel and they put it in where it does not belong, things are not going well for them. Boils are breaking out on their body. Rats are doing stuff, and it's just not cool. Amen? And so after a while, they get smart enough to realize that this, this, um, this ark being here is a problem for us. We'll give it back. So they send it back, and, it, and, and, and David is going to get the ark and bring it back to Jerusalem. Amen? It, th that story ends with this false god down on his face in front of the ark. It's, it's fascinating. Please read it, okay? And so, and so David's bringing the ark back. They've they're got it on a cart. Bad idea, David. They've got it on a cart. They're bringing it back to Jerusalem. The ox stumbles. The cart begins to tip over. This man reaches up to steady the ark. He falls over dead. They said, hold up. Let's not do this right now. I don't think we've got it all figured out. Our transportation system needs an overhaul. And so they left it at Obed-Edom's house. Obed-Edom is a Gentile. 
The ark stays at Obed-Edom's house, and it stays there for a while, and, and vice versa, instead of the ark bringing curses on, like it did on the Philistines, while it's at Obed-Edom's house, man, things are great. The bananas are twice as big. The squash is twice as big. Everything is growing. Everything is flourishing. Prosperity is coming to his life. The glory of God is on his house. And Obed-Edom is so captivated, a Gentile, by the glory of God, that when David decided to come and get the ark, take it back to Jerusalem, Obed says, we're going to leave all this, follow the glory, and I'm going to give the rest of my life to serving that glory. It was kind of a big deal. Are you with me? When David brings that ark back to Jerusalem, he sticks it right back in the tabernacle of Moses, correct? No. For the first time, unprecedented in history. To a God who was so particular about his glory on that ark that if you touched it while it was falling over, you died. David returns the ark and does not put it back in the tabernacle, a tent of the law. He sticks it in the tent, the tabernacle of beloved. Oh, no, 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 no. Y'all can do better than that. Y'all going to say, mm, y'all say it like you mean it. Ooh, mm. You mean to tell me that in all the stru- instruction of the law, all the, down to what the tassels need to look like, somebody tell me what the description of David's tabernacle is. You can't because it's not there. The ark comes back. And simultaneously now in Israel, there is a tabernacle of Moses, and it is being led by the priests, and they are offering burnt offerings, and they are having their Passover, and they are making the once-a-year sacrifice. Are y'all with me? And there is the, the daily operation of that style and type of worship, style is a bad word, type of worship being happened at the tabernacle of Moses. And simultaneously, as soon as that ark comes into Jerusalem, David takes off his outer garment and he begins to dance, twirl, shout. His wife says, you're kind of a dork, and, and, and then she kind of pays the ultimate price. Okay? And then he come and he puts that ark not in the tabernacle of Moses, in the tabernacle of David, the beloved. How many of y'all are tracking with me? How many of y'all are sleeping? Raise your hand. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you for being honest. The rest of the liars, they have their place in the eternal fire, but you know, sir. Okay. Now listen. So here he is. It's mind-boggling to think that the ark of God. It's not going back to the tabernacle of Moses. It's going to the tabernacle of David, the beloved. And for 40 years, symbolically, sits there until the temple of Solomon is built. David remains for 33 years. David remains for 33 years as the king of Jerusalem with the ark sitting in his tabernacle. Over here... If you hear the sounds, you can hear the sounds of calves and, and birds and lambs. And you can hear their screaming as, as there is the sound of sacrificial worship going up before God. It's not a pleasant sound. It's not a what we would all identify as a glorious sound. But God nonetheless accepted it. And the sound of death is coming from the earth to the ears of God. But over here, and, and, and for years and centuries, that ark has sat there and heard that sound. But over here, there's a completely different sound. There's stringed instruments. There's singing. There's shouting. There's clapping. There's dancing. There's, there's songs being written daily before the Lord. And it is the sound of worship. Are y'all with me? Over.
over here when the oh come on over here when the ark was in the tabernacle they had to stick it in this little bitty room made from cloth walls and they had to veil it and once a year the high priest would walk beyond the veil into there where the where the where the ark was and he would present the sacrifice of the lamb <laughs> okay over here there was n there was no veiling of the glory of God. Over here, that unveiled glory kills them if they see it. Tradition teaches that they sewed bells on the bottom of the robe of the high priest that if they stopped hearing the ringing of the bells, they knew to drag the rope that they had tied around his foot because he had sin in his life and he was dead. The power of that glory that even in transportation I stopped no, I'm, I'm out but over here that ark inside of a beloved tent that ark inside of a beloved tent could be seen with no veil and worshipped before with no veil and ministered to without anything Interrupting the flow. Yeah, yeah. For <laughs> In case y'all think I'm lying, let's read the Bible. This is just the fact that there's two different tabernacles. Verse 37 of First Chronicles 16. So he left Asaph and his relatives there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Verse 1 of this chapter tells us that they brought it into Jerusalem and took it into David's tabernacle, okay? So he left Asaph there to minister to the Ark of the Covenant continually as every day's work is required. Just go to the next verse, please. Obed-Edom, remember that dude? He takes his 68 relatives and they move from his house to Jerusalem. And the son of that dude and Hosa as gatekeepers. And Oded Edom and these guys spend the rest of their lives ministering to the ark. Okay? Next verse. He left Zadok, the priest, and his relatives, the priest, before the tabernacle of the Lord. Not the tabernacle of David, the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place, which was Gibeon. Gibeon and Jerusalem are not the same place. So there is two tabernacles simultaneously operating in Israel, a tabernacle of law and a tabernacle of beloved. Jesus comes onto the scene. Jesus comes onto the scene. His announcement is made by an angel, and she says, on the throne of David, he's going to sit. And when, and, and when Jesus goes onto the scene, he comes as a skin tent, the Son of God unveiled before creation. Are y'all out there? Like, I don't know about the Bible makes me just go blah, blah, blah sometimes, and this is good stuff, right? Are, are, am I, uh, Okay, good. And so here we are, the Son of God unveiled before creation, the one who will shed his own blood to put on the mercy seat. Are y'all with me? He's before God unveiled, before creation unveiled, and he walks this earth for 33 and a half years. Somebody say amen. Okay? And at the same time, we see the, the struggle and the fight between the, the tabernacle of law that even at the death of Jesus, the moment he died, there was a veil that was rent in the rebuilt temple. We see the tabernacle of law and the tabernacle of beloved by the king of beloved and the son of beloved who sits on the throne of beloved who is going to have an eternal kingdom of beloved. We see them in a friction with one another. 
We don't see him breaking the law. We see them, uh, one sounds like, uh, you know what, you've been caught in the act of adultery, but I say to you, go and sin no more. And one sounds like in the distance over the hill, if you're spending the night in Jerusalem, you can hear the, the crying and the bleating of another calf that's given his life into the service of our God. Are y'all with me? One sounds like that when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, they're singing and shouting and dancing. At the same time, one sounds like, I, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Thy, right? When they called the hands of God was the apparatus by what they'd put the sacrifice in and close it up on the, the lamb or the calf. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. He was at the same time fulfilling the tabernacle of Moses and establishing the tabernacle of beloved. But see, the other thing is that when Jesus comes and he dies and he raises again and he's ascended and then the Holy Spirit comes, the church is birthed. And when the church is birthed, for the first time in the history of humanity, the gospel is made available to the world. Watch last words by Jesus on the earth. Go ye therefore into all and see when the tabernacle of David comes so that the nations and the Gentiles. Are y'all following me? So here's the son of David. And he becomes the sacrificial lamb. And we preach that and we preach that. And that is absolutely true and there's nothing wrong with that. The son of God, the lamb of God. And he presents that aspect of worship before the, the throne of God. Amen? Amen? But at the same time, when he comes, he's establishing the tabernacle of David. See, it's interesting to me, if you read, there is the promise of a restored tabernacle. Just pause one second. Forty years after the tabernacle of David, the temple of Solomon is built. David wanted to build this house. God said no. His son Solomon builds this house. Are y'all checking with me? I know I'm getting boring, but y'all just pinch yourself, slap yourself, stay awake, okay? All right. And so the tap, the temple of David, the temple of Solomon, excuse me, is being built. The 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 uh, ark goes back into the temple, okay? If you'll notice, there is a huge list of how that temple is supposed to be built. Right? Huge list of how that one's built, huge list of how Moses is built, no list of how it's a it's it's referred to as scholars as a common temple. A common tabernacle, a common tent. Paul said, We are earthen vessels. <laughs> we are Paul also said we are skin tents. When the son of David come, there's a fulfillment of the tabernacle of, of David being restored that when the church was birthed there was now this body of believers who, who worshipped God, could not worship him in a building because the building isn't the church. The, the church is the skin tents that they all are. The common who is giving their life to take the gospel to the, to the, ends, the ends of the earth and they are winning the world for Christ. Amen? But so we had the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David whenever the actual tabernacle of David was built, the restoration of it. When Jesus comes, the restoration of it. When the church is birthed and we have the, the eternal restoration of it, that one day again we are looking for a tabernacle. We have been taught... And hear me, I'm not trying to say this is wrong and this is right. I'm saying we have been taught to focus a whole lot of a restored temple worship. Can I help you out with temple worship? In temple worship, there is sacrifices. That is the worship of the temple. There was no singing over here. There was no dancing, clapping, shouting. There was animals being sacrificed. That was the worship. The aroma of that smell, that sound, all of it was the worship. When Jesus died on that cross, Paul said that he became the sacrifice once and for 
all. There will never, ever, ever be a legitimate sacrifice of worship unto God that includes sacrifice of animal and or man. He is the fulfillment. He is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. When we go to heaven and we worship, heaven comes, whenever in eternity we worship, we are not worshiping with animal sacrifice. It's over. Which is why he said, I will restore a tabernacle of David, beloved, where we sit. Right now, when David set up the tabernacle, he's, he appointed 24 musicians led by one priest Right now, at this very moment, there are 24 elders around the throne of God, and they are singing, holy, holy, holy is the lamb who was slain. Right? You guys hear what I'm saying? David had a pattern as well for his tabernacle. David had seen into eternity something that was happening before the throne of God, and he was establishing on earth in seed form something that we would do forever in eternity, and that is to worship before the throne of Yahweh, daily saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God. And so the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David is the tabernacle of beloved is when Jesus comes. And the fulfillment is when the church is birthed. And the fulfillment is you. You are a, oh, Jesus, help me. If the Holy Ghost is inside of you, you are a skin tent who goes on unveiled before the glory of God who is supposed to be having worship and prayer coming off your life. Paul said, I pray continuously. Paul said, I pray without ceasing that inside of you there can be the tabernacle of David locked away in the closet of your bedroom as you, be, as you the skin tent, are worshiping the Father unveiled and the glory of God is there. Yeah. A common tent. <laughs> A common tent that's made glorious because of heart and ark. A common tent that's made glorious because of heart and glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says there is a, a fading glory. A fading glory of a system. I preached on this a few weeks ago. A fading glory. And over here that says there is an increasing glory. That the life of the Spirit that worships God is increasing line upon line, precept upon precept, revelation to revelation, increasing in our worship and our understanding of who He is. So the fulfillment is Jesus. The fulfillment is the church. The fulfillment is you and me. I'm telling you, it's more than just worship. It's worship embodied in a kingdom of people who are beloved and who have the heart of beloved, and who have a king who is the object of their beloved. Are y'all with me? And that tabernacle is also coming, and we look for it to come. Is anybody out there? We look for it to come. So I'm not looking, look, again, I do not say this to be rude. I'm not, when I was about 11, I heard my first sermon on the calf the little heifer that was getting ready to be uh, uh, um, sacrificed in Jerusalem as the reinstitution of an earthly temple. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? The red heifer is already there, and the instruments are already being gathered. They've been there for about 35 years. I'm only 38, so I might have fudged a little bit. And we get so focused on this coming earthly temple so that we can be excited about when Jesus is coming back. I'm saying to you, that's okay, get it. But I'm saying to you, my heart is looking for a tabernacle, a common tabernacle that I can sit in where the unveiled glory of God is sitting there and I can minister to him and I can have that encounter with Jesus because that's the one that will stand for eternity. That's where the spirit and the bride are saying, come. 
So what's eternity look like? What's, what's worship in eternity look like? I'm telling you, it looks like a kingdom of beloved people who worship him from their heart with everything they are. Amen? Amen? Let's read one more scripture and I'm done. Paul says this, For we know that when this earthly tent... Oh, Paul, he was smart. How many of y'all have an earthly tent? Raise your hand. Okay. We know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, there's two factors of biblical eschatology that people want to look for. Rapture, and or death. Last week I talked to you about the spear and the bride longing for his return. Amen? Let's talk about the other side of the equation. Let's talk about most of us in this room, if not all of us, will one day, appointed unto man once to, we're going to face death. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house, a tabernacle in heaven. How many of you are seeing something a little bit different right now? Uh, so I used to see a little my, my little shack on the back 40 of heaven and someday yonder when this, right? You see what I'm saying? I'm not looking for my little mansion in heaven. I'm looking I'm looking for a tabernacle of eternity that was promised to a man named David a long, long, long time ago. And that's where whenever I leave this tent, I'm going to go get in that tent. Are y'all out there? When we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, that in heaven that tent is me and I'm in that tent. Okay? Made for us by God himself, not made by human hands. We will grow weary in our present body. Somebody say amen. amen. Go float the cattle and tell me if you don't get weary. <laughs> we long to put on our heavenly bodies. Like, any, Come on. All you 20-something-year-olds are like, what in the world? All of, all of you that are not 20, I'm not going to name any numbers because that's dangerous, but some of y'all are longing for your eternal body. <laughs> we grow weary in our present bodies. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For when we put on our heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. Somebody say amen. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. Now hold up. He's not just talking about your aches and your pains. He is referring, come on, what was inside of John the Revelator when he said the spirit and the bride are groan. They're, caught, they're saying come. There is a groaning of the coming of his kingdom that makes me say, oh God, come on. I'm longing for something to come. I'm not longing to escape. I'm longing for something that I can't get here. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan inside, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? Ain't no grave. Right, Lacey? Sorry, Lacey. <laughs> Sorry. I should not have done that. That was rude. Don't hold my body down. I'm from Mountain View. I can do that. It's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up in the life victory that was purchased by our King on Calvary. Amen? God himself has prepared for us this as a guarantee of that promise. Are y'all reading your Bible? as a guarantee of that promise of that eternal body that will stand in the eternal tent and worship the eternal Son. We have the Holy Ghost. No, 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 do better than that. We have the inheritance, the Holy Ghost. 
that in, I'm telling you, that in supernatural seed form, I can tap into something that's already in eternity. I can plug into something that's in heaven and bring it down to this earth. And that when this world is falling apart, when my life is falling apart, when things are going wrong, I can plug in into the eternity. And then I can plug in to where I will exist forever and I can draw strength from a kingdom that has no end by the power of the Holy Ghost. So we are confident. Come on, who's some confident believers in the house this morning? We are confident even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, oh, I'm good and I can feel his presence and there's some really good moments with him here, but I'm not at home yet. Come on, how many of y'all longing for home this morning? I'm not at home yet. And I don't believe you're longing from home because you're so dissatisfied with this world, but there's something inside of you that says, I was built for eternity in a tabernacle of beloved. So we are confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. Verse 7, for we live. Huh. I live by believing in what's there, not by what I see here. Oh, let me preach to you right now. Too much, way too much, far too much of your life is governed by what you see right here. Far too much of your life is being determined by a very temporal situation. And you were created to live from eternity to here, not from here to eternity. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Verse 8, yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. Verse 9, so whether we are here in this body or away from this body, I have one goal. Whether I am now existing in that tabernacle of beloved or whether I'm longing for it to come, I still have one goal. is to please him now. Stand up on your feet. Lacey, come jump on this keyboard real quick. That's the tabernacle of David, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're longing for. That's what's promised to be restored. Amen? Amen? I want us just for 10 seconds. I know it's 1157. If I'm a good Southern Baptist preacher, I get you out by 12. So we've got three minutes. If you'll lift your hands one more time. And let's pretend, more than pretend, let's live by faith that we are standing in that tabernacle. Because I am. Because remember, you are the skin tent that's unveiled before his glory. Because you have no right. You have no equal. Now and for. Do you hear what you're singing? Yours is a what? Yours is the kingdom. <laughs> yes, it is. Yours is the name above all. You have no rival. You have no rival. You have no Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. So I want you to listen to me with your hands lifted and your eyes closed. When you sing about that eternal kingdom, you've got to understand that you're not singing about meeting a temporal need, but you're standing about, you're singing about stepping into the power of something that is for eternity. And if he can reach eternity, he can reach your need right now. 
We have made his kingdom too small. I'm telling you, when you sing yours is the kingdom, you're singing about a kingdom that shall go on and on and on and on and has no end. It is that powerful. So let that power come from heaven now and let the inheritance of that kingdom, the Holy Ghost, let it strengthen you to face your day. Let it strengthen you to fight your battle. Let it strengthen you to walk your walk. Let it strengthen you to be everything that God's called you to be. One more time, from a position of faith, you have no right. Now and forever, God, you reign. Cause yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name of One more time. I'm talking about from your gut, as loud as you can. You, you have no rival. You have no evil. So Holy Spirit, right now with our hands lifted, we say, even so, Lord, come quickly. Oh, God, we long for your spirit. We long, we long for your appearing, Holy Ghost. We long for that eternal kingdom. We long for the king who's going to sit on the throne of beloved forever and ever and ever. And I say, make me in seed form on this earth, that kingdom right now in Jesus' name. Let me be a seed on this earth of that coming kingdom, demonstrating your power, demonstrating your glory, demonstrating your love, demonstrating your heart. Because it's a heart after you, kingdom. It's a love sick kingdom. And though the world may come against us, we will say, Have you seen my beloved? I am love sick. God, may we fully embrace your beloved kingdom, your beloved tabernacle. May we fully embrace the beloved Son. In Jesus' name, and everybody in agreement said,